Today I want to finish a sermon series that we have launched called Building a Prophetic House. And um, it's just been a very teaching sort of series. And today I think will be the same because I think as you go to establish culture, one of the things you have to do is you have to explain what you expect. Because if we don't explain what we expect, then we all just do whatever our own personal expectation is. But, you know, God puts a church on the same page so that the church can operate in harmony and in unity. How many know things get done when you operate in unity? And so one of the reasons why I've taught this, and I'm really trying to establish what it means to be a prophetic house, is because you don't become prophetic accidentally. It takes, great, it takes great understanding, it takes revelation, it takes the operation, most importantly the operation of the Holy Spirit because you can't be prophetic without the Holy Ghost. I got like six amens right there. But if you try to be prophetic without the Holy Ghost, you act weird. And how many know the Holy Ghost is prophetic and is not just speaking what is true, he's speaking that which is to come. And so really this whole issue of, uh, of being prophetic is really about intimacy as we've talked about because if you want to hear the voice of the Lord, you've got to be close enough to hear him when he talks to you. And so we've been talking about that, that for the last several weeks. We talked about the purpose of the prophetic, the power of the prophetic. This morning I'm going to talk about processing the prophetic. How do you process a prophetic word? Now, if you're going to live in a prophetic church and go to a prophetic church and somebody say, I don't know if I want to go to a prophetic church. The opposite of a prophetic church is an unprophetic church. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to an unprophetic church because it is prophecy that God often uses to mobilize us into the will of God. It is prophecy that God often uses to help our faith to grow and explode as we can expect and anticipate the things of God coming to pass in our life. Many people have no faith for tomorrow because they don't have a word over their tomorrow. But prophecy is God's spirit speaking through someone or to you personally about what is to come. When you get a word from the Lord, faith accompanies that word so that you can expect and believe for that word to come to pass. If you have an unfinished word hanging over your life, I declare to you there's a reason why you're still here and there's a reason why you're still believing. It's because God's going to finish what he started and what he's spoken. And some of you have never gotten a prophetic word in your life. And I'm going to tell you this, that's getting ready to change because as we become a more prophetic people, I believe one of the things that's going to be done in this house is we're going to get stronger as the prophetic word comes into our lives, helping us to shape the God-sized future that God has for every one of us. First Thessalonians chapter 5. So we've been in this whole thing about becoming a prophetic house, and we've talked about the purpose of the prophetic, the power of the prophetic. Today we're going to talk about processing the prophetic word. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Let's go there. I put this in, um, I believe this is in the uh, Passion Translation. Can we read this together off the screen? And um, and, and, and if you don't have the passion, that's okay. And, and if you don't like the passion, it's even more okay. Uh, this is my screen, and we'll read what version I want to put up there, okay? So this is the passion. Tra <laughs> never mind. Okay. It's, never mind. The passion translation. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. If you can see it, say, I can see it. If you can't see it, lift your hands. We're going to pray for healing in your eyes right now because that's big, right? Let's read this and go together. Never restrain or put out the fire. Man, that's good. Anybody feel better just reading that? How many don't want to scorn prophecies? If your neighbor can't lift their hand, get your belongings quickly. You don't want to sit beside someone who scorns problems. I'm just kidding. So today we want to talk about how to process and test prophetic words. Jesus, help me today. Because you are the great teacher. You're the revelator. And I ask, Lord, that you would stand up in me today and that they would not just hear me, but they would hear you speaking through my heart and through my lips today, oh God. 
So I surrender my faculties and my being to you. Get all the glory, Lord Jesus. We love you. You've been so good to us. And where we would be without you. We don't even want to think of it, God. So today, would you just speak, give revelation, clarity for the next few minutes. Let people be engaged by the Word of God and let the Word of God engage them. And I pray that revelation and wisdom would sit and rest on this house by the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. If you receive that, say amen. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. So for the last several weeks, we talked about building a prophetic house and living in a prophetic culture. That's not weird. The God you serve knows the future. It seems to me that if you believe that he knows the future, that we should be excited and thankful that he's willing to reveal certain things about our future to us by his spirit. I told you the second week that when a prophetic word comes, Paul reminds Timothy in 1 Timothy, he reminds Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18 that when you get a prophetic word, the word becomes a weapon. And you use the prophetic word to do warfare against the devil when you go into battle against him. He starts telling you, you can't, you won't, it'll never work. But the prophetic word says, devil, you're a liar. God already said this is going to happen. If God says it's going to happen, I want to tell you something. Take it to the bank. If God ever says it's going to happen, it doesn't matter how unlikely it seems. It doesn't matter how impossible it may feel. When God releases a prophetic word on your life, faith comes with the word of the Lord. You actually begin to believe for things that are now accessible to you that were previously unaccessible to you because you didn't have faith to believe for them because you didn't have a word of promise that it belonged to you. When you get a word of promise that something belongs to you, God always connects that prophetic word to the faith necessary to believe for that word to come to pass. And so we've been talking about being a prophetic house, living in a prophetic culture. My prayer is that, that everyone in this room would become more prophetic. That people in this room would understand that the power of God's Spirit residing within you will enable you to hear the voice of the Spirit and release something that is prophetic over the lives of your brothers and sisters, those within this house and those outside of this house. And when you are a prophetic person, your obedience to God, according to what I taught you the first week, does one of three things. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, it exhorts, it comforts, and it builds up. Every prophetic word you release over someone has that threefold manifestation. You exhort, which means you call out the thing that God deposited in them. You comfort, which means you alleviate darkness, heaviness, and oppression. And then you build up. You literally... When you are prophetic and speak the prophetic word of the Lord over someone's life, you literally are like the general contractor that is taking the blueprint that God has of their life in heaven and you are speaking it over their ears into the earth so that their life on earth lines up with the blueprint of what God intended them for, to, for them to look like in heaven. This is what prophecy does. This is why it's important to be prophetic. And I told you that, that, that we've got to be very careful. I'm just, rem this is all reminder stuff. None of this is my teaching time. We are not in this sermon yet. This is all reminders. We talk a whole lot about speaking in tongues in the Pentecostal church, but I am terribly afraid that we have gotten infatuated with talking in tongues and we have abandoned the thing that Paul said is actually most important to the development of the body. Praying in tongues is not for anyone else but the person praying in tongues. How selfish is it of you and I to only talk about a doctrine of tongues when there are people who need to know what God is wanting to say to them and when you abandon prophecy and focus on tongues, Jesus, I'm saying something right here, you have, a, you have a whole group of people who are missing out on what God is trying to reveal to them and you may be built up personally because you pray in tongues all the time, that's wonderful, but speaking in tongues has no benefit for the person sitting next to you. Speaking in tongues is for you and your spirit. Hello, somebody. Prophecy is for the edification and the building up of the body. How many want the body, this church, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? How many want your brothers and sisters sitting next to you and on your row to walk in the authority of God, to walk in the victory of God? Come on, how many want the people of God that you love the most to know that God has a plan for their lives? It doesn't mean the enemy won't come, but how many know the word of God is greater than the threat of the devil? 
And so we want to be a prophetic people. And it's important if we're going to be prophetic that we be close to God. We be intimate with the things of the Spirit so that when the Spirit speaks to us, we have a willing heart and we're able to release what God said. Now, as we become a place and a people who more deeply embrace the prophetic moving of God, we must make sure we not only learn the power of prophecy, but we must also be a house that is courageous and willing enough to process the prophetic. Because I'm going to tell you, one of the things as a pastor, and there are different hats we wear, but one of the things as a pastor that I have had to take lots of time over the uh, 18 years that I've been lead pastor of this church is fixing things that got jacked up because of prophecy. Yeah. If it's genuine and it's real, it's always beneficial. If it's fake and fraudulent, it's always hurtful. This is the very reason why Paul had to talk to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says in the the New King James, it says, do not despise prophecy. In the Passion Translation, it says, do not scorn the prophetic. Why did he have to tell the church at Thessalonica, do not despise prophecy? It's very simple. Because there were so many false prophecies being spoken that the church was getting fed up with the prophetic. Paul had to warn them that you do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because there are bad people, bad apples giving bad words doesn't mean that God is bad, that his people are bad, and that his word is bad. You and I have got to learn how to test prophetic words so that when something is not right, we know what to do with it. And when something is right, we know how to respond to it. It. Can you say amen this morning? So processing the prophetic word, this is going to be like the most basic, uh, applicable teaching. This is not very deep in revelation. I don't think this is how to. Look at somebody, tell them how to. So how do we, re- what do we do, I should say, what do we do when we receive a prophetic word? How do we process a prophetic word? When we receive a prophetic word, Paul tells us that the first thing we should do is prove it, test it. The first thing you should do when someone speaks prophetically over your life is test it or judge it. Remember this, taking notes, and I wish everybody would just jot down some notes today, even if, it's, if, even if you, you, you throw them away later. If you write it once, you get it better in you. Watch this. You do not judge the person, you judge the prophecy. God did not say judge the person, he said judge the prophecy. Now, I want to fix something that a lot of my Pentecostal friends, especially those who call themselves conservatively Pentecostal, which I'm not quite sure what that means, but but, because I I don't think any brand of true Pentecost can be classified as conservative. We speak in languages no one's ever heard of before that's not conservative. That's supernatural, right? We believe eyes that are blind can open up and be healed. Lames that, legs that are lame can, uh, can, can be healed and walk. There is nothing conservative about Pentecostal theology. If you believe in a supernatural God, the world looks at you and I and thinks we're crazy. Hello, somebody. So I'm not sure what conservative Pentecostal theology is about, but many of my conservative uh, Pentecostal, conservatively theological Pentecostal friends say something like this. If they make a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass, they're a false prophet. That is not what New Testament teaches. New Testament, listen to me carefully, New Testament judgment of false prophets is based on what they do with the doctrine of Jesus. Okay, now I am not advocating in any way that you run around speaking prophetic words that don't come to pass and just speaking from your flesh. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But sometimes we get so judgmental and conservative and harsh that when someone genuinely trying to be used by God makes a mistake or misses it, we call them a false prophet. A false prophet in the New Testament, read the book of Jude, read First and Second Timothy. False prophets are people that took pure, true doctrine, molested it, twisted it, and intentionally tried to deceive the people of God. That's what a false prophet is in the New Testament. If someone comes up and is doing what Paul said to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when he said, everyone earnestly desire the gift of prophecy, 
If everyone who earnestly desired the gift of prophecy and stepped out in courage and faith to deliver what they felt like God was saying to them for someone else, if they did that and failed and were immediately condemned and stoned because they were a false prophet, no wonder nobody wants to try to be prophetic. They would be scared to death of dying if they missed it. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Paul encouraged every one of us to pursue the prophetic grace of God. He would not have done that if he knew when we made a mistake, when we made a mistake, God would immediately judge us as a failure and everyone in the congregation would have gathered around us and stoned us. False prophets in the New Testament are people that messed up the doctrine of Jesus intentionally. So what I want to tell you today is that when you get a prophetic word from God, don't start with judging the person, judge the prophecy. And how do you judge the prophecy? Well, first of all, what does it mean to judge? Everyone say judge. Say test. Say prove. It's the Greek word doki matzo. And it literally means it's, it's, it's a, from a family of words that indicate the ability to authenticate the real thing. The word dokimos is the adjective form of the Greek word doki matzo. Listen to this. In the ancient world, there was no banking system, right? There were no, there were no, um, uh, there was no, there was no place where money was made sure it was handled correctly and that everything was perfect about the, the, the coin. In fact, in the Old Testament, or in the, in, the, in the old times, in the Bible times, they took metal, they heated it to a high temperature, they liquefied the metal, and they would pour the metal into coin molds. And when they would take the coins out of the mold, they would have to shave off the edges of the coin to get rid of the sharp edges. And, and since there was no standardized money procedure, everybody who made the coins, it was up to them if they were going to be honest men and women of integrity and actually leave enough silver in the coin that would pass the test. And when they would take the coins, some people would, because of their, um, their heart not being right, they would shave extra pieces of silver off the coin and they would stash that silver to the side and the coin may look like the coin, but it had edges that weren't fulfilled with the silver. It wasn't a real whole piece of money. It had been shaved. And when, and when they found men who only used coins that were legitimate, Legitimate and had the exact weight that was prescribed. In fact, in one year, they passed 80 laws forbidding people to shave the edges of coins because so many people were getting cheap with how they, they created their money and they were shaving the edges of it, keeping the, the shavings for themselves and then releasing the coins into circulation, but they weren't the real thing. And when, I know that was a lot, but catch this. When Paul says, test every prophecy, what he's literally saying is, find the people and find the coins where there are no shaved edges. Find the stuff that doesn't skip. Find the stuff that is the real thing. How do you know if a prophecy is the real thing? There are several things that let us know that a prophecy is the real thing. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, Test the prophecy. It is not unspiritual for you to get a prophetic word and process it. Only a fool opens their heart to receive something that they have not pro processed appropriately to determine if it is worth being kept in their life. So when someone gives you a prophetic word, a couple of things to remember. Number one, if you receive a prophetic word from God, it must bring honor and glory to Jesus. Simple enough, right? God isn't going to give you or I a word that causes us to get the gain in glory and honor. God isn't going to give me a word that makes life possible without him. And sometimes we get these prophetic words that make us feel like we're invincible. Listen, prophetic words should always tie you back closer to the heart of God if it came from God. Number two, this is very important. 
The prophetic word must be in harmony with the written word. Where are you, church? The prophetic word must be in harmony with the written word. Why? Because the written word has preeminence and precedent in everything. If the written word didn't have preeminence and precedent, then we'd have chaos. Because I've seen people walk up and prophesy other people will marry them and the person they told them they were going to marry is already married. You're not saying anything in here today, but that's jacked up. Why? Because the Bible never promotes polygamy. I don't care how many prophetic words you get about it. You and I should be married to one person. Amen, somebody. And anytime you start getting prophetic words that violate this written word, it's junk. Now, let me be real clear with you. Not every prophetic word is going to come out of Scripture. But it will be scriptural. You follow me? It may not come out of Scripture verbatim, but it will be scriptural. So when, when you get a prophetic word, the first thing is, does this bring honor and glory to Jesus? Second thing, is this in harmony with the written word of God? Third thing, third thing, not only is it going to bring honor and glory to Jesus, not only is it in harmony with the word of God, but if you get a genuine, authentic, prophetic word from God, listen, it will accomplish what a prophecy is supposed to accomplish. Well, what is the prophecy supposed to accomplish? I already told you that. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. Everybody say prophetic. Say this is a house becoming, come on, say becoming more prophetic. Well, if what we release over one another is a true prophecy, it will accomplish one of three things. According to 1 Corinthians 4, 14 verse 3, number one, it will exhort. Everyone say exhort. If I speak a prophetic word over elders' life, it will do one of or all of or two of these three things. It will exhort which means to call what is within to flow out of his life. Number two, it will comfort, meaning to alleviate distress, panic, or worry. Or number three, it will build up according to the blueprint of God over my life. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, a prophetic word will build up, exhort, or comfort. Now you say, Pastor, what if I have a word for someone that doesn't build them up, exhort them, or comfort them? Then you don't have a prophetic word. You have something else. Hallelujah. Well, what if I have a word of judgment? You don't have that. Well, the Lord said, no, he didn't. And I felt like I'd hit a little stump right here in prayer when I was praying over this because there's some people who are arrogant enough to think they're holy enough to rebuke everybody else for their problem and prophetically draw out of their issues. But but, but the reality of it is you can't point out somebody's toothpick in their eye when you've got a telephone pole hanging out of yours. Okay, okay, let me just stick to the word, it's best. What about when God gives me a word for someone that doesn't exhort, comfort, or build up? Then you don't have a prophetic word. 2 Timothy 2, 4 4 verse 2. Look at this. Paul is talking to Timothy. I don't know if I put that in there or not, Chad. If I didn't, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Watch. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Look at you. With all long suffering and teaching. One translation said with great patience and careful instruction. Pay careful attention to this. The instruction Paul gave to rebuke and to reprove and to warn is not given to the church. It is given specifically to Timothy from Paul. Paul doesn't tell the entire church to rebuke and reprove and warn each other. He tells the pastor Timothy to do that. I'm not getting no help right here. Meaning that reproving and warning and rebuking should be left to those in leadership. Prophecy is encouraged for all of us. Fixing people is reserved for leaders. 
I didn't get nearly enough help on that right there. Bunch of, bunch of Presbyterians in the house this morning. But I want to tell you right now, when somebody is out of order, it is not in order for you to get a prophetic word and expose their sin and shame them in front of the body. The Bible is very clear that fixing and correcting and warning and rebuking should be reserved for leaders. And it bothers me when people, the only thing that can come out of their mouth is negative stuff about other people. In fact, it's a reflection of the negativity that exists within their own heart and they've not, some, I have people, do you, anybody in here have social media harassment? There are some people, I want to get them a sign. It says, get a life. Because it doesn't matter what kind of video we put out to encourage people in the body. They will always find there's, there's some precious people. Everything is heretical to them. Everything is demonic to them. Everything is negative to them. Can I help you understand something? If you are constantly berating, attacking, warning, rebuking, and reproving everyone in the body of Christ, then I got news for you. They're not the ones screwed up. You probably are. And you probably need a trip to the altar to pour your soul out and get your heart made right with God. Say amen or owe me or something. I don't care. These self-appointed fixers who float all over the world telling everybody how evil everybody is but them. I'm telling you right now, it's a scary thing to walk around judging people. Well, somebody got to bless God, point them out, and it ain't you. Let kingdom leaders correct, rebuke, and reprove. How can we have a body built up if everyone were appointed to fix everybody? Paul tells the whole church, the whole church, pursue prophecy. Do you understand the power of that? It's the one thing everybody is released to go pursue. You literally don't have to feel guilty getting down and praying a prayer like this. Lord, use me today prophetically to speak into someone's life. You you ready for this? God actually blesses those kind of people who pray that kind of prayer. And I'm watching this happen more and more in our church. This is the wildest thing. And, 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 and she's here, and Chris knows this happened. I'm standing with Chris in an office a couple of weeks ago, and we get a call from the governor's office. And the governor's office said, we want you guys to write some prayers for the, for the governor, and we want you to write some prayers for the leaders of the state, and we want you to write some prayers for the state, and we're going to compile this, and we're going to give it to every Monday morning, I think, via email, and it's going to be a specific prayer, and we want you to be a part of the prayer. So this is wonderful, right? And then, and then she says, and at some point, Pastor, we want Pastor Kevin and Devin to come to Nashville and, 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 and pray with the governor, and I leave that meeting, and I come to afternoon prayer. And it was noon. And I come and I'm standing right here and I just come out of that wonderful meeting. And and one of the sisters of God came, Katie, come and stand right beside me. And she said, I don't know if you know this or not, but God's about to hook you up with a governor. (laughs) And when you get there, she, she said other things I can't prophesy right now. But she had no clue. I had just walked out of a meeting talking to the governor's office. Chris was talking to the governor's office about doing something about prayer in the state of Tennessee. And then I come stand right here and I lift my hands. I said, God, you're the one that does all this. You connect it. You connect the dots. You open the doors all for your glory. And then Katie comes and stands and says, I saw you in the governor's office and you getting ready to do something with the governor. Why are you telling me this? Because it's a confirmation and my faith exploded and it went through the roof. Why? Because I believe when God starts talking to you about your future, you start having the faith to access things and to come into realization of things that you previously did not think you had the access to. Give me one prophetic word. It'll jerk me up out of my depression. It'll get me up out of my problem. One prophetic word from God will cause me to believe I can storm hell with a water pistol. 
pistol. If God ever says one thing to me about my future, I know that as long as I keep my eyes on him, hell can't stop the purpose of God from coming to pass in our life. Prophetic word will change your life. Anybody in here had a prophetic word change your life? Anybody in here had a prophetic word change your outlook? I mean, you were like this. And then somebody comes and said, I believe God is getting ready to do A, B, and C. And all of a sudden, wow, you come to life. What is that? Faith. You can't have faith in nothing, but my God, you can have faith in the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. So what happens when you test the word? Does it bring honor and glory to God? Is it in harmony with the written word? Where's my notes? Oh my God, I left them. God gives somebody a prophetic word as to where I left my notes. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. Some of y'all smile. It'll do you good. Okay. And the prophetic word must accomplish what prophecy is supposed to accomplish. Meaning, when you get the word, it leaves you edified comforted and built up well there had been some times pastor I didn't feel edified comforted or built up we're going to talk about what to do with that okay so what happens when you test the word and it passes the test now let me say this this is both individual and corporate Okay, I want to tell you how I'll, I'll do this personally over my life, Elder. When somebody speaks a word over my life, I immediately begin to ask the question, does it bring honor and glory to God? Does it draw me closer to Jesus? And does it do what prophecy is intended to do? Okay, if, if it does, and, and, and then I treat it one way. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But corporately, this works too. If someone were to stand up and release a prophetic word over this house, okay, most of the time, immediately, we know if what we're hearing is from God. Amen. If you've been walking with God any time at all, when somebody starts giving a prophetic word, either through an interpretation or a prophetic utterance, you can tell almost immediately if it's on or off. Okay? If it's on, I usually stand up and say something like this. Let's all give God thanks for the word of the Lord today. Why? Because so many times people say, thus saith the Lord, and we're all like, wow, shouting, falling out, but nobody received it and thank God for it. But if it's, a, if it's not a prophetic word for the house and it was spoken over the house, here's what I'll typically do. I'll find some leaders, and I'll walk up to them. That didn't sit right with me. Did that sit right with you? No, that didn't sit right with me either. Why do you do that? Because it's my responsibility as the leader to come back to the microphone and say, that wasn't from the Lord. Well, why would you do that? Because if I don't, hundreds of people are going to be left in utter confusion because they have one view of God, but somebody just stood, stood up and rebuked everybody and made everybody feel horrible and everybody feels farther and farther away from God. That needs to be corrected or everybody leaves in confusion. Now, we, don't, we can do that without bashing the person who did it. I'll never forget being in college. I was at a church and a, and a person gave a message and, and, and an interpretation in tongues. And the interpretation was this. I promise. I see your Cadillacs. I promise it went just like this. I see your Cadillacs and your nice suits, and the Lord says he rebukes you this day. Now, there are thousands of people in this service, and this joker has gotten courageous and goofy enough to stand up and rebuke everybody with a Cadillac and a nice suit. And I'll never forget, I'll, it, I, was, I was 18 years old, I'll never forget as long as I live, the preacher that day, I won't call his name because many of you know him, he he. He had been quiet because it was, he was an evangelist. He was visiting. And, you know, you, you get quiet when somebody starts prophesying. And after the prophecy was done, you could feel everybody in the room just like, what was that? And he looked at the pastor and he said, Pastor, I have reason to believe that was not a word from the Lord. And the pastor looked back at him and said, I agree with you. That was not a word from the Lord. And the man picked the mic up and said, we want to let the house know that was not a word from the Lord. Lift your hands and let's all praise God for the true word of the Lord. It was marvelous. 
And I say that because if you don't fix it, confusion and a spirit of anarchy will rule. So if I ever have to fix something or a leader ever has to fix something, it doesn't mean that, 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 that everything is wrong and everything's out of control. It just means somebody missed it. We just got to fix it and keep going. So what happens when you get a word from the Lord and it's real? Two things. Everybody say two things. Number one, if you get a word from the Lord and you tested it and it passes the test, number one, you file it. Why do you file it? Because a word from the Lord may be for that moment or it may be for years down the road. Sometimes you got to be careful not to get rid of stuff that doesn't make sense to you. Because it may not make sense to you in the season you're in now, but if you'll file it down the road when you start seeing things line up, you just run back to that prophecy and say, oh, wait a minute, that was spoken 10 years ago, but it's just now coming to pass over my life. You better be careful what you write off simply because it sounds too big. I don't know who I came to mess with, but let me mess with somebody today. God will talk to you about a future that seems too big for you to believe in your now. But if he didn't tell you it was coming, your faith would remain in a place of limitation. So he had to speak to you about your future. And even though it's not going to happen now, Habakkuk said in the end, it will declare itself and it shall not lie. Slap your neighbor say, file it file it if it sounds too big if it sounds too awesome if it sounds like it's unbelievable it's probably God it just may not be now but it is in the future and you've got to learn how to file stuff now so you can get to it later look at somebody and tell them file it yes when your marriage is going through hell and it looks like you're going to lose it but the Lord steps in and said I see you doing something in your future together and the devil said that couldn't be because look how messed up this is oh no devil I'm gonna file this one because the word of the Lord shall not come back void if God I'm preaching to somebody in this room right now slap somebody tell them file it you got to learn how to put the word in a place you can get to later this is a true story when Devin and I get a prophetic word now, I'm like, give me my phone. Record. Why would you do that? I bet I have 30 prophetic words recorded on my voice recorder. Sometimes when I'm going through a struggle, Scott, I just go back to my prophetic words. <sighs> yes, I forgot about that, Lord. Oh, See, y'all can't handle this. You want some angel to float down out of heaven and write it in the clouds and take a picture of it. No, no, no. You better learn how to steward the word of the Lord. He's not required to speak it more than once. And if it means something to you, every time he talks to you, you ought to file it. Look at somebody tell him, file it. If you got a kid that's hooked on drugs and acting crazy, if you got a marriage going through hell, if you got a job situation that looks like it's about to go under and you get a prophetic word, stop allowing the circumstance to dictate to you if you are going to receive the word. The situation doesn't change the word. The word from the Lord changes the situation. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in here? Have you ever got a word from God that looked different than your reality? Have you ever got a word from the Lord that changes your reality? If you ain't got a word from the Lord that has shift your reality, you ain't got one yet. Because you can get a word from the Lord so real, it will change your reality. Oh my God. I'm telling you right now, David, God will take you off the backside of a sheep field, handling some sheep and handling some lions and handling some bears, and God will call you into the house, and God will put an anointing on your life that will cause you to rise up over a nation and feed a whole group of people, and you'll be a king, and everybody looking at 
that you said, I thought he was a shepherd. That's because you didn't hear the word. When he got a word, the word will take a shepherd and turn him into a king. I can't find no help on Sunday morning, but one word from God wasn't the most shire. One word from God will change your life. Slap somebody, tell them, file it. I've had prophetic words come to me for people that when I started releasing them, I'm like, whoo, if I was you, I'd be dancing, baby. And the funny thing is, I've seen God take some people who were broke. They were broker than a badger. I'm talking about broke, busted, and disgusted. I'm talking about messed up from the chest up, beat up from the feet up, tore up from the floor up. And then you give them one prophetic word and it'll jerk them out of the gutter. It'll jerk them out of a mess. It'll jerk them out of a routine of defeat and into a place of victory. Slap your neighbor, tell them, foul it. Some of you, I call you to remember the word of the Lord spoken over your life as a child. The devil wants you to believe God forgot what he said, but heaven and earth will pass away. The word of the Lord shall abide forever. Slap your neighbor, tell him, file it. File the word of the Lord. If it seems too big, file it. If you don't know how it's going to happen, don't throw it away. File it. Woo. The second thing, if it's a real word from the Lord, not only do you need to file it, you need to faith it. Elbow your neighbor, tell them faith it. Put some faith on it. Uh, um, when I start thinking about faith in it, I think about a man named Abraham. A hundred year old. Married to. Oh, she was getting up there too, y'all. Sister Sarah, and the angels came to the city looking for Abraham, and they said, you're going to have a son. Say prophecy. Say prophecy. You're going to have a son. Uh -huh. And Abraham believed the word. Now, I know he struggled with the word because he also tried to do the word in his own strength. Uh -huh. We don't put that in Romans chapter 4. We talk about Abraham was a man of faith. Oh, yeah. Go talk to Hagar. Y'all not going to help nobody in here. Uh -huh. Ishmael came about because Abraham was trying to produce in the flesh what God spoke in the Holy Ghost. Uh, where's my help at in this church this morning? There are some people trying to produce the word in your strength. But listen, if it's a true word from the Lord, the only thing that you will ever do to bring the word to pass is believe it. Slap three people, tell them believe, 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 believe. It ain't about what you do, it's about what you believe. I can't find no help on Sunday morning but I feel the Holy Ghost rising up in me right now. It's not about you bringing the word to pass. It's about you trusting the God who spoke the word and is able only to bring the word to pass. Faith it. So I'm trying. So when Abraham, when Abraham started hearing the word of the Lord, the Bible said he believed God. And here's where it is for some of us. Some of us get a promise. Um, um, uh, let me, yeah, 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 Elder Harry, come stand right there. That's the promise. Oh, Lord, what a promise. That's the promise. Yes, God will speak something to you about your future that is off in the distance. And he says, that's where I'm taking you. The reality of it is I'm not there now. Have you ever been complicated, confused, and frustrated with the word? Because somebody spoke something over you that did not consider your present reality while it began to project to you your future destiny. I can't find no help in here today. Sometimes God will give you a word about your destiny that does not accommodate or look like it makes any sense when you consider your present reality. But the word does not come to you. The promise doesn't come to you. The promise pulls you closer to it. And it separates you from the reality you're now in and pulls you closer to the reality of God for your life. So when Abraham, here he is over here, 100 year old, Sarah, 99, and you get ready to have a baby, 
Do you know Abraham waited, don't miss it, 26 years between promise and fulfillment? God said, you're going to have a baby. And here's what Abraham did. Abraham started walking his faith journey. You stay still. And at some point in the journey, he started thinking, I'm getting old and I better handle this. Because God must have forgotten how old I am. And if he doesn't know how old I am and he forgets that I'm getting old, then he won't remember that I'm old. And because he doesn't remember that I'm old, he's, he's obviously forgotten that I'm old. And since I'm getting old and I don't know how long I'm going to be here, I better get to work so I can bring this promise to pass. So come on in here, Hagar. It's going to be comfortable in here on Sunday morning, ain't it? Because this is what happens when spiritual people get in the flesh. They start considering the promises of God and they start remembering what God said and they look at the mess and they look at their age and they look at their failure and they look at all the time they wasted and they say stuff like this, I better get to work. Come on in here, Hagar. But can I tell you, when God gave you the prophecy that he was going to give you the promise, he considered in his plan the failure you would engage in. I lost some people right there. I lost some judgmental people right there because you think that the prophecy was only going to happen so long as you earned it. But God sent me to tell somebody today that what he spoke, what he spoke over somebody in this room, he took into full consideration the weakness and the frailty of your own flesh when he made you the promise. And just because you got bent out of shape and tried to rush the process and almost screwed the whole thing up, don't you let for one second the devil tell you that it's it's too late for God to finish what he started. At some point, you got to get like Abraham. And although you've made some mistakes, you can't keep stumbling around your whole life trying to wonder if God's going to do it. Oh, no. Ah, you got to be able to say like Abraham, God said it. And if God said it, I don't care how big of a failure I am. Ah, I'm still going to believe the word of the Lord. Slap your neighbor. Tell him, quit stumbling around. Quit stuttering around. Quit walking around wondering if it's still God's word over your life. It's still yes and amen. Slap three people and tell them faith it. Faith it. Believe the word, family. God can talk to you about your future, but if you don't faith it, it won't happen. When you get a real word from the Lord, file it. Thank you, Elder. Faith it. Well, Pastor, what happens if I get a word from the Lord and it ain't real? I'm going to give you this and I'm going to get out your way. neighbor say hey neighbor if you can't file it come on talk to him like you love him tell him if you can't face it flush it what's that sound pastor that's the sound of every joker that tried to prophesy something negative over your future God told me to tell somebody today you got to learn how to flush it they told you you would never get up from that but the devil is a liar they told you you would never recover from it but the devil is a liar they told you God was through with you but the devil is a liar somebody holler flush it The sound of freedom for somebody. Woo. 
I felt freedom come on me right then. I felt somebody shake loose from a religious lie that somebody tried to put on your life. People that hated it, people that were confused, people that tried to bring you down, spoke words over you that God did not speak and you've been walking around your whole life in bondage and today thrush it in the name of the Lord. You got to file it. You got to faith it. But sometimes you got to get a word and flush it. You ready for this? Shake it off. What do you do when somebody walks up to you and says, you're going to hell? I tell you what you do. That's the longest flush I've ever heard in my life. You'll always be broke. Your kids will always be screwed up. This city will always be religious. You're not required to receive everything spoken over you. I'll never forget, and I'm closing. Stand with me. If you leave, we're going to flush you on the way out. Listen, I'll never forget when God told me I was going to marry Devin. Like seven other people came to her and said, God told me, me and you was going to get married. And she came to me, and she said to me, what should I do? You told me God told you, and they told me God said that they were going to be my spouse. What should I do? (laughs) You can't flush the will of God. I'm still here. (laughs) By the grace of God, I'm still here. Listen to me. You keep walking with God long enough and somebody in the kingdom or who thinks they're in the kingdom is going to miss it one day and you're going to be the recipient of the miss. And there are some people in this room today hurting because of something someone in church told them. There ain't nothing like religious hurt. They're not, there's not much worse pain than someone inflicting it on you in the name of God. Amen. I feel like there's some people in here today, boy, we've really felt this strongly in intercessory prayer last week. There were some people in here today going to be here today that have been the recipients of some words that the enemy wanted you to believe were from God, but really they're meant to be flushed. You won't go forward in confidence in God until you can flush something that didn't come from him, that you've been thinking came from him. Heads bowed. Flush. If you're in this room today and you say, Pastor Kevin, I need to flush some stuff. I need to get rid of some stuff. There's some stuff in my life that I've been believing and it's hurt. I I just really feel strongly right now, family, that there's somebody in here, the pain and the confusion and the hurt that you're feeling was inflicted in the name of God, but it wasn't God. Somebody needs to get it off of their life today 
If I'm talking to you, would you lift your hand right now? I know this ain't everybody, but I know it's for some people. Yeah, 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 yeah. If your hand is up, or it should be, you need courage for this one. I recognize that. But if you'll take a step today, I'm anointed. I'm anointed to wipe off some of your lives, the mess that the enemy tried to put on it with false words. Come stand with me right now. Hurry. If you lifted your hand or you should have, come on. Come stand with me. Come stand with me. God bless you. God bless you for coming. 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 God bless you all for coming. Uh huh. So, someone today is trying to crawl out from under religious hopelessness that was put on you because someone spoke evil, heavy words. It created no sense of future for you. I even feel like there's some people in here who've been divorced that the place you came out of spiritually they told you you'll never make it to heaven because of that divorce and it's hurting you and it's causing you great pain. Jesus. Can you lift your hands and just give God two minutes of prayer right now. Somebody's life is going to be changed after this day. Jesus. Jesus. Come on, just pray for these precious people. And you know what? I just heard the Holy Ghost say, pray for some people who need to move but haven't moved yet. There's some people in this room right now. Your life is so full of bondage and confusion because of words that were spoken over you and you've been believing them and you're not supposed to believe them. You're supposed to flush them. Today we're going to flush it. Anybody else who needs to move right now? I'm telling you, I know this is a different sermon. I know this is a different ending. But somebody needs to flush some stuff off your life, out of your heart. Get it out of your mind because God's not through with you yet. Yep, right there. Something just broke. God, set somebody free right now. Says, if you need this, come stand in the altar right now. I need this mess off my life, out of my future, out of my mind, out of my heart. Their words haunt me. Their words make me feel like I'll never be what I was supposed to be. Right now, I want you to come before I pray. And I'm not trying to manipulate anybody, but I'm telling you right now, there's a grace for a new beginning and a grace to be broke, to break some stuff off your life. Anybody else? God bless you for coming. God bless you for coming. God bless you all for coming. Everybody that's coming, may the Lord bless you. God bless you, sweetheart. Come on. Come on. Yep. I'm getting ready to pray for I'm praying for every person that comes in this altar today. And it's going to be a simple prayer. I'm going to walk by and lay my hands on everybody in this altar. And here's what I'm going to say. Today, that word, we flush it out of our lives. It's broken. The power of it is broken. Uh -huh. The power of it is broken. It will not vex them. It will not control them. I need people praying in the Holy Ghost all over this church right now because there's some real deep pain in this altar. Jan Parker, come help me, sweetheart, because you've got this word in intercessory prayer. I'm going to ask you to help me pray too. Come on. Praying all over the church. There's some tears flowing in this room today. Because the enemy crafted a lie and a stronghold. He crafted a lie and a stronghold in an attempt to prevent this man and woman of God from becoming everything the Father intended for them to become. And the enemy found somebody that he could speak through. And that word shaped their future. But today that thing is being broken. Some of you have been carrying this for years. Some of you have been carrying this thing for years but it's coming off of your life today not because I'm the one that's doing it but because God said he didn't want his children to be in bondage to a false word any longer that, that word didn't pass the test it can't be proven it can't be tested it's not authentic it brought fear it distanced you from God it hurt your faith it damaged your confidence ah, but today it's coming off 
I need people praying in the Holy Ghost. Some things are getting broken this morning. They're getting broken this morning. I need the oil. I need the oil. I need the oil. Somebody help me right now. Uh -huh. I need every elder, every prayer leader, every deacon, every pastor praying in the altar with me right now. Because I'm telling you, the enemy don't want to let some of these people go. Their minds have been under this, this deception for some time. But when they come out of this right now, they're coming out and they're never going in bondage to it again. I'm anointed to tell you if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Today, we flush every negative lie, every negative prophetic word, every untrue word that was spoken in the name of God. We believed it and it's hurt us. We wondered and were confused, but today we flush it. Come on, come on. Ah, can somebody come help me? Lace, can you come sing a song? Can we play when I thought I lost me? You knew where I, yeah, 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 yeah. I need everybody that's going to stay to lift your hands right now and begin to ask God to break the power of negative words off of lives. Come on. Pedro, I speak blessing over you. Uh, Pedro, I speak blessing over you. I break every religious lie off of your mind. It's not too late, and it's not too dark, and it's not too deep. Loose this man. Let him go. Let him go now. Let him go now. I need people praying all over the church. Let him go now. In the mighty name of the Lord, Shanda Rabbi Asaya. Flush it. We flush it. We flush it. We flush it. We flush it now. Go! Go! Off of his life now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Devin, I want you to pray for Jim. I flush every word that tried to shape, that tried to damage. I cover and speak blessing. You are And I declare you're a favored son of the living God. Oh, a favored son. It didn't work. It didn't work. Flush it. Flush it. Off. Loose her. Loose her. Loose her. Jesus' name. I thank you, God, for this family. Today there's some stuff we're going to file. Today there's some stuff we're going to face. And there's some stuff we're getting ready to flush. And I declare every negative word of religion, every word, Lord God, spoken that was a limit to your power and your purpose for their life. I break the power of that word now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I speak blessing over this house. It's turning today. It's turning today. We're going to put faith in the word. And I'm going to declare this over you because I just heard the Lord whisper. The enemy will wish he ever, never messed with you in the first place. God, you're going to use their pain and ashes for your glory. Oh my shot, my mind. The enemy will regret it. Bless her today. I flush it out of her mind by the power of God. Jesus, loose her. Jesus, loose her. Jesus, loose her. There will. Oh, Jesus. Over terror, over terror, I speak blessing now. Putting you back together. Come on, Lacey, sing it. Come on, LeBron, play it. Come on, family, declare it. When I thought I lost me, you knew where I was. So paid a basa. So paid a basa. So paid a basa. So paid a basa. Flush it. Flush it. Flush it. 
Flush it. It's gone. Flush it. Flush it. It's gone today. Jesus. Jesus. Sweetheart, in Jesus' name. I declare this thing that was declared over you has no authority over your future. And I release the blessing of Abaddon over you now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Bless, bless, bless. Father, I thank you for this woman of God. And every word spoken that hindered and prevented that causes and even confusion is broken now in the mighty name of the Son of God. I declare she's more blessed than the enemy for her to believe. And I thank you for the authority and every step she takes. And today we flush this negativity. I flush this hindering word. Break it now. In Jesus' name. Loose it. Loose it. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. In Jesus name. Break it. Flush it. Go. Jesus. Jesus. Put your hands, Tyler. Come here, Tyler. Jesus. You're breaking some religion off. Jesus. Break the religion off. Break the lock. Go. Flush it. Flush that word and will not prevail. We speak the blessing of God over her now. We speak the blessing of God over her now. In the mighty name of the Son of God, I speak blessing over your woman of God. And every word of confusion and heaviness, I loose you from it now. Life, Holy Spirit, touch her life. Holy Spirit, flush it, loose her. Break your shadow out of that prison. Break her out of that prison now. Jesus. 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 Flush it. Flush it. Go. Break the power of an offer spirit now. Loose her. Jesus. Loose her. Trent, lift your head. I flush that word right out of your mind. And I declare you a man of God. Fill it with purpose. Fill him with authority. Fill him with fire in Jesus' name. Loose for today. Jesus. Thank you for this woman of God. Today I break the power of that negative word. Go. 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 In the mighty name of Jesus. Go. In Jesus' name, I declare right now, Father, your word over several people in this room that are confused in their identity sexually is a result of someone speaking one phrase, one word, one sentence over them that shaped and confused their minds in a way that God, you never intended for their minds to think. I break the power of that off of them now. 
I declare over them right now they're fearfully and wonderfully made. They were not an accident. They were not a biological result of two people coming together in a one-night stand and just somehow happened to come here. You knew them before they were born. I declare over them now that every identity issue I hear the Spirit of God saying every issue of identity is being resolved today with the Word of the Lord. And I break and I flush off of you and out of your mind every word that the enemy tried to use to create an alternate identity in your life. I'm not speaking to everyone, but I'm speaking to a couple of people in this room right now. And I just declare your freedom in Christ. I declare in Jesus' name you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I declare that what it took years to try to twist, God is untwisting in this one moment. Their minds are coming into a place of wholeness now. The pollution, the pollution is being Removed supernaturally by the grace of God now. Jesus. I declare over them right now wholeness of mind. Jesus. There's a wife, there's a wife in here who feels like a failure. God saying, going to heal your mind and your heart of the pain that was inflicted. In fact, the person I'm speaking to is not even married anymore. And the enemy is trying to tell you the failure was your fault and it was because you're a horrible person and I just relieve you from that because that word was actually spoken over you. I relieve you from that pressure and bondage now. In fact, God's going to free you and forgive you and help you to move forward. After the pain of feeling like a failure and the reality of divorce, you're going to move forward. You're going to get married again. You're going to see the grace of God in your future. I'm getting real specific, but the Lord, I really believe God's given me a download. This person is, you were in a marriage and there was unfaithfulness, infidelity. It was blamed on you, ma'am. You have felt, because you were told you were, you have felt like you were the failure. Today, God's healing your heart, touching your mind, lifting the confusion and the pain. Thank you, Father. I love you. I love you, Jesus. Can we just lift our hands to him before we leave today and before we do anything else? Abba, thank you for new beginnings. For new beginnings. For restoring the years. For restoring the years. for restoring the years. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. I thank you, Father God, that for the rest of his days, that bite will not hurt because the poison is not there and the wound is healed and the bitterness and the pain and the and Lord, the anger, I remember God, but I declare right now this man of God is stepping into a new level of joy. A new level of joy because as a father, Father, I thank you that his sons and daughters are coming into this level of joy as well. And I just break every lie. I thank you that every lie did not prosper. Every tongue that rose up you condemned it for that is the heritage of the children of God blessing in the next six months you're coming into a blessing of restoration 
and it's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Jesus, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. Lift your hands, church, one more time. Lift your hands, church, one more time. Thank you. I worship you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. You say, Pastor, could it really be that someone could live in that place of believing a lie that long? The woman with the issue of blood was sick 12 years. The woman in the synagogue in Luke's gospel was bent over in a defeated position, staring into the earth for 18 years. I just came to tell you that when Jesus passes by and he touches your life as he has today, we stop talking about the last 12 years, the last 18 years, and we start looking into a glorious future. So right now, Father, I pray over every man and woman of God left in this room that they would embrace a glorious future in spite of a painful past, a glorious future future a glorious future a glorious future ando sebende de akisha ando doho atalaroban chaya a glorious future i know we've had a painful past but a glorious future i feel the holy ghost on that a glorious future a glorious future. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You're not through yet, God. Praise the Lord. When I thought I lost me, they keep praying. You can pray as long as you'd like. Remember, no service Wednesday night. And you put me back.